Good evening, everyone. I think we're going to get started. I'm Matthew McClendon. I'm the director and CEO here at the McNay, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our Founders Day at the McNay, honoring Marion Kugler McNay, and also to welcome you to this very special talk with curator of prints and drawings and curator of modern art, Lyle Williams. Yes. Throughout the day today, we have had several events celebrating our founder, each tied to a part of her, a particular part of her biography, her love of architecture, her own art practice, and finally, tonight, her collecting. In doing so, we wanted to offer our members and the public a glimpse into the life and work of Marion McNay and her passions. Tonight, we will conclude Founders Day by hearing more about her original bequest and the expansion and evolution of the McNay's core collections. Her passion for collecting is why we are all here today. She had a vision for how her life's work would impact the community, and we take very seriously the responsibility we all shoulder here at the museum in carrying her legacy forward through our mission to engage a diverse community in the discovery and enjoyment of the visual arts. Thank you for being here and for your support of the McNay Art Museum. And I will now turn things over to the star of the evening, well, maybe second to Marion, Lyle Williams, who has been working, yes, yeah, clap again, who has been working with this collection for the last 32 years, so I can think of no one better to take us on this journey tonight. Thank you, Lyle. Is that Ethel doing all the whistling? Yes. <laughs> I owe you some money. Anyway, um, good evening. I'm going to get started and jump right in because, frankly, I'm a little nervous, not about speaking to you all, but I have 70 years to cover, <laughs> probably in about 45 or so more minutes. So uh, you'll forgive me if I, uh, if, I, uh, if I rush through one thing or another. But please, I'll try to stop in time to uh, take questions. I don't promise to answer them all honestly, but um, we'll, we'll, I'll at least entertain the questions. So let's, just, let's get started. And one of the things I want to do with this talk is um, I was asked, first of all, to talk about just Mrs. McNay, and I thought a lot of us know that story, and I'll certainly talk about that and talk about what is so remarkable about what she accomplished as a collector and a benefactor of this museum. But I think it's, it's also important to remember what, that other people were sort of there to pick up the baton when, uh, when Mrs. McNay you know, founded the museum at her death in 1950. And the story that happens after 1950 is just as fascinating as what happens you know, while she's still around. So um, you know, again, I hope I get through all of it. Now, Paul, there we go. So this is a young Marion Kugler McNay. As you all know, the basic story. She was born in Kansas, rural Kansas. Um, and you know, it's the remarkable thing, but there's so many remarkable things about her story. And one that I find that's so remarkable is she comes from this rural background um, and decides at a very early age to go and study art at the Art Institute of Chicago. And you see her birth year there, 1883, which means she was 17 in 1900. And when I think back to what my great, great grandparents were doing in 1900, they weren't going off to study art at Chicago, especially not if they were women. You know, this is a remarkable thing for this young, independent woman to do. But she, in fact, does it. Who knows how she convinced her family, her parents. But uh, somehow she might makes her way to Chicago, and this has a huge impact on her, not only as an artist, but later as a collector. And I always love to show the head study on the left. This is by Mrs. McNay as a young art student at the, the Art Institute of Chicago. I love this particular watercolor because it has such a freshness and immediacy to it. And those of you who have ever taken an art class Oftentimes, one of, the, one of the exercises is to turn to your studio mate and to do a portrait of them. And I think this is what this is. And it has this sense of immediacy and this freshness to it that you can really see Mrs. McNay's talent as a watercolorist. 
The gold bracelet on the right is a little bit more staged, a little bit more formal, I think, and a little bit less successful as a watercolor. We have over 200 of Mrs. McNay's watercolors in the collection, but the reason I'm showing you this one is there are, two, there are two aspects of this watercolor that are very important to remember with her collecting. One is her interest in color. There's some very interesting color patterns that are, are color combinations going on with this particular work. And then the patterning in the background of the figure. These two elements, this interest in color and this interest in, in sort of a decorative pattern would be something that would inform much of Mrs. McNay's collecting uh, over the decades. And I think you can see that interest in color and pattern in this gay, this amazing Raoul Dufy, the Gulf Juan. Uh, before coming to the McNay, as Matthew said 32 years ago, um, I really did not like the paintings of Dufy. But when I got here and I saw this painting, Mrs. McNay's eye sort of convinced me this is, this is definitely an artist worth looking at. And in fact, I think the McNay's Dufy, which she of course acquired, is uh, one of the best Dufy's in the entire country. This is a, a real knockout of a painting. So we all know the story that she, she built this house in the, in the 1920s. She had, you know, she'd gone to Chicago. She had married sort of her childhood sweetheart, a man named Don McNay. He enlisted in the, in the army here in San Antonio. In fact, they, they spent their first you know, time together in South Texas, sharing an adobe hut on the banks of the Rio Grande River. Uh, and very romantically, very tragically, they said their fa farewells in front of the Alamo. Don McNay goes off to fight the good fight in World War I and dies in the Spanish influenza epidemic of 1918. Mrs. McNay goes away, she marries, I don't know, three more times. <laughs> people, get, people get hung up in the number of times she got married. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's just details. But anyway, uh, she eventually decides to move back to San Antonio because it's really where she had been happy. And so she comes here and tries to make a life on her own. And imagine that, you know, this is, she's not from San Antonio. This is still a fairly small town at that point. She starts building this house, which at the time was in the middle of nowhere. When you, when you look at maps of San Antonio in the, in the 1920s, the urban mass, the urban sprawl of the city really ends at Hildebrand. I mean, which is quite an amazing fact that here's this woman uh, independently living on her own, as, you know, building this house and building this collection and sort of really doing it on her own terms. This is, you know, one of the most remarkable aspects of her life, not only as, as an individual, but as a collector. And of course, we all owe her eye a tremendous debt. Um, she was a very you know, adventurous collector. We all look at this Picasso collage now, and we know this is a masterpiece of 20th century art, you know, a real pioneering example of synthetic cubism but when Mrs. McNay bought it sometime, you know, between 1930, 1940, uh, Picasso was not the name he is now. And to buy this cubist work by a man who was a noted communist, you know, this was, this was a real daring thing for her to do. So this is all part of her personality. I think it's important to remember that, you know, this was not, this was not easy for her to do. This required, you know, scholarship and learning and research and looking, really honing her eye as a, as a collector. And I think that her background certainly as, a, as an accomplished artist really helped in that endeavor. Um, but imagine, you know, when she dies in 1950, this is, this is also one of the remarkable things, almost a miracle that happens in San Antonio. She decides to leave the house, her art, uh, the grounds, and um, some, a substantial amount of money to found the McNay Art Museum and leave it as a gift to the people of the city. Uh, she was very, you know, she was a visionary in terms of the people she placed on the board when she, when she died to, to make sure that her vision was followed through on. Uh, but, you know, again, it's, it's a miracle that this, this museum even happened 
in the first place. And it's thanks in large part to her vision as a, as a collector and a philanthropist. So I talk about a dear friend of mine, John Palmer Leeper. He was our founding director. Uh, he was hired soon after Mrs. McDay died and arrived in the early 1950s to take on the task of becoming the first director of the McNay. Uh, he was always amazed by the museum. He said it, it sprung forth like Athena from the head of Zeus, you know, that it, it had this, this endowment, this collection, this building, and he was really enamored of this institution and very enthusiastic about what he was tasked with doing as the first director. He was of the great generation of American directors. He studied with Paul Sachs at the Fog, and he was, all of his classmates, you know, in the post-war years, post-World War II, went to various posts all throughout the United States. So there was this network of all these Paul Sachs acolytes who traveled all over the country and, uh, you know, did exactly what John did, which was to raise the level of professionalism at these various museums, including the Bengay. And in fact, John was on the committee to, uh, to come up with the rules of accreditation uh, that museums still follow to this very day. I love looking at this picture because I can see him turning at me, looking at, like that at me. He always called me Buster. And he would, he would, he would turn at me and, and gaze at me, and he would raise an eyebrow and say, Buster. And I remember one time I had made the mistake of, uh, I was talking about the weather, and I said, well, it's too bad the weather's so inclement. And he turned to me and he raised his eyebrow and he said, Buster, we don't use a fancy word like inclement when a perfectly good word like bad will work. <laughs> so he, he could be a little intimidating, but he was also one of those friends who um, was, was kind in a way because he, he, was, he was great at imparting his knowledge to others. And you always knew that if John corrected you, that meant he cared about you as well. So the miracle of John Leeper is that, you know, he, he took this miracle that Mrs. McNay left us, and then instead of letting it devolve into a boring old house museum, he identified people in the community who could help him, uh, you know, not only preserve the vision of Mrs. McNay, but to build upon it. And that was a critical thing that he did, beginning when he first came here in 1954. And of course, in 1955, the very next year, uh, the, the great Oppenheimer collection comes to the McNay. This is the first major gift at the museum. And uh, John took it in. Uh, you know, so our collection continued to grow, and in fact, grew almost from, from day one. Mrs. McNay, as many of you all may know, specifically, prohibited her funds to be used for acquisition. She wanted the funds to be used to, to run and maintain the museum, but not to actually acquire anything. So that was the big challenge for Leeper, was to identify collectors in the community who would share his, his vision, but also be generous enough to give their art to a museum that had somebody else's name on it. You know, think about that for a minute. You know, if you're a prominent collector, that's something you might be reluctant to do. But he was able to do it um, and did it very early with the Oppenheimers. This is probably my favorite work from the Oppenheimer collection, the Jan Gosart painting. He also did it with, uh, with uh, an attorney and his wife, Mary and Sylvan Lang. Um, Sylvan, by all accounts, was, was a difficult person. He had his fingers in a lot of pies. Uh, but he and John got along like a house on fire. Um, you know, who knows? We never know why we become as friends with people we're friends with. But Sylvan and, and John became great friends, and John convinced the Langs over a period of time this was not overnight. It, you know, it took dinners and cajoling and convincing and, and a lot of other things uh, to get the Lang collection at the McNay. So not only did John get the collection from the Langs, but he also got the galleries to house it. So this is a remarkable accomplishment. I think in John's tenure, there were at least 10 separate additions to the original McNay house. Again, a sign of the fact that he was bound and determined not to allow the McNay to become a moribund house museum. He wanted it to be something greater than it was already. 
uh, Sylvan would always tell the story about this particular work, this great early 1940s Alexander Calder. He said he remembered a cocktail party when he was, and the Calder was out in the pool house at the Lang's house here in Alamo Heights, and Sylvan was carrying the Calder. You know, it's very lightweight, and he was carrying it around the backyard, and he was near the pool. And suddenly, a gust of wind came along and blew the Calder into the pool, and it sank to the bottom of the pool, and it's held together just by a wing and a prayer. You know, it, it falls apart at the, at the slightest suggestion. And so it fell apart into all of its component parts at the bottom of the pool. John Leeper, without missing a beat, stripped off his, his suit and tie down to his skivvies and dived in and picked up the calder piece by piece and brought it back. And Sylvan years later said that's one reason the McNay got the collection. <laughs> a very dedicated director. Another one of my favorite um, Lang pictures, this great Arthur Dove. The great thing about the Lang collection was that it dovetailed so beautifully with what Mrs. McNay left in her bequest uh, and contained masterpieces of American modernism, particularly works of the Stieglitz circle, including this wonderful Arthur Dove. Every time I look at this, it's just sort of so uplifting. It's called Dawn, and while it's not a, you know, a literal representation of Dawn, the colors and these floating forms really gives you a sense of the elation, you know, of a new day, of a, of a new dawn. So this is one of those pictures in the collection. Whenever I look at it, it just automatically makes me happier. And, you know, there's tons of stories I have just looking at these pictures, but I'll, I'll resist. In the interest of time, um, another collector that uh, John worked very, very closely with, in fact, I think that um, he, she and John were sort of co-conspirators really to make the McNay what it was, was Margaret Batts Tobin. And uh, Mrs. Tobin, you know, uh, back in the, I think it was in the 1950s, she was on a layover in, in New York, coming back from London, back to San Antonio. She went into Nodler's in Manhattan, saw all 10 of Mary Cassatt's color aquatents and bought them. And the story is still famous in New York among print dealers about this crazy, crazy Texas lady who just walked into Nodler's and just bought, you know, at this, ex you know, this extravagant amount of money, these 10 Mary Cassettes. But, you know, it was a brilliant stroke on her part. And so John spent years, decades, you know, every time he was at the Tobin house, they were always on a, on a staircase going up to the top floor and John would always re remark to Mrs. Tobin that those would make a much better uh, showing at the McNay than in her house. <laughs> and eventually she agreed, and over, the, over a course of several years, she didn't give it all in one big bunch. She would, didn't want to let go. She didn't give it as a whole series of 10. She gave it over a period of years. So you know, this remains one of the masterpieces of, our, of the McNay's print collection. John, I should say, you know, one of the great things about Paul Sachs was that he was one of the, the great connoisseurs of 20th century um, prints and drawings. And I think that, that John, you know, inherited that, that love and connoisseurship of, of prints and drawings, and that's why we have such a strong collection. It was really John who began to build that, really, in the 1960s. John was also a brilliant um, shopper. <laughs> uh, John himself never had a lot of money of his own, but the thing about John, one of the great lessons I learned from John Leeper was no matter how much money you have, you need to learn how to spend it well. And John, of everybody I've ever known, knew how to spend money in order to have a good time. And uh, one time he was in New York, and he had seen this Marson Hartley on the left hand of the, of the screen, and he wanted to buy it for himself. Uh, but, you know, being a dutiful, ethical director, he actually presented it to the board at the time and said, you know, I really want to buy this for myself, but, you know, I, I'm obligated to show it to, to the board uh, and give them right of first refusal. And, of course, they bought it. The price was $1,500. Um, you need to add 
more zeros than I can count in order to buy that today, even if you could find it on the market. Another great early acquisition on John's part was the great Kirchner portrait of Hans Frisch. This is one of the absolute best German Expressionist paintings in the country. Um, it, it came from the collection of Walter Bereis, one of the few things that Bereis, whom I knew at Yale, one of the very few things that Walter Bereis ever let go of. And uh, it has traveled a couple of times to, to Mr. Lauder's Neue Gallery in New York. And every time it goes to the Neue Gallery, we get a threatening letter from Mr. Lauder saying he's going to steal it. So we're very fortunate that we have both of these pictures in the collection, thanks, this, thanks in large part to John's you know, incredible eye. Now things get a little bit more personal because the, uh, the, story, the stories begin to overlap a little bit with my time here. Um, when I first arrived at the McNay back in 92, my salary was paid by a woman named Jerry Lawson, whom you see at the far right here with her family. Her dad, Gus, who's at the far left, Mr. Gus, was a wildcatter, um, and he made a fortune in the oil business, in the oil patch. Jerry grew up in the oil patch. Um, he retired to a house on Ocean Drive in Corpus, and one day he was sitting out on his porch, and he said, you know, he was looking out at the bay, Corpus Christi Bay, and he said, you know, I bet there's oil under that. And so he began to think and devise a way of tapping into that oil, and became a pioneer in offshore oil drilling. And so a second fortune came his way. So, you know, a remarkable family. Jerry Lawson uh, moved to San Antonio in the 1960s from, from Corpus. She had, she had no family here, but eventually uh, would become really part of the McNay family. She became very, very close with John Leeper, Tom Wright, so many other people uh, I could name. And fortunately, I became very close with Jerry as well. Uh, the very first time I met her, you know, here's this woman, she's paying my salary. Uh, she, she and her mother gave us the funds to build the print gallery, which was the first facility of its kind in Texas. You know, a huge accomplishment for a museum the size of the McNay to have a facility like that. Um, so I was a little intimidated meeting Jerry at first. And I, I still remember I had my tuxedo from high school and she had this sliding glass door. The house looked like the Brady Bunch house. The house was like not much from the outside. And I thought, hmm. And, but I remember seeing myself reflected in the glass, the sliding glass doors as I'm about to meet my benefactress, right? So uh, I walk in and I offer Jerry a drink and uh, she wants a scotch and I say, okay. And I open up the bar. The bar is, I don't know, 12 feet long, just huge. And there's an entire shelf of scotch and it ranges from like Laphroaig and the really, really finest Lagavulin and you know, aged Macallan, all the way down to the cheap stuff, you know, J&B, Dewars. And I said, well, Jerry, you know, what do you drink? And she said, oh, honey, I like the cheap stuff. And I, I, I poured her a drink. She took one sip and she, oh, she shook her head like this. And I thought, oh my God, I've killed Jerry Lawson. <laughs> and I said, you know, is that okay? And she said, oh, honey, that's just perfect. Um, that first night, we were, we were on our way to Robert Tobin's last big shindig at Oakwell, and uh, we both got lost. Um, <laughs> these things happen. Uh, but I knew Jerry almost immediately uh, because my own family, uh, a, part, a branch of my family, had, had also grown up on the oil patch. So I knew immediately who she was, and uh, just we got along really, really well. Unfortunately, I didn't know her very, for very long before she died, but she was a remarkable woman and a remarkable collector. She was introduced to the McNay by these two works. She was on a business trip in Detroit, and she brought in one of these wood, Gauguin woodcuts, and these are not just any Gauguin woodcuts. These are lifetime impressions printed by Gauguin and a master printer in Paris. And she brought in one for John Leeper to see. They had never met before. She had no idea who he was. He certainly had no idea who she was uh, because her, the maiden name was Glasscock, but Jerry always called herself Lawson, and it wasn't until the maiden name was revealed that people would go, oh. Um, so she brings in this first Gauguin, and John says, well, that's, you know, that's really impressive. 
And a short time thereafter, she brought in the next Gauguin woodcut on the right, and he said, I think I need to take you to lunch. <laughs> so they, they became, you know, bosom buddies. Jerry had an eye for Jasper Johns. Um, I, you know, this is remarkable how some people, some people click with other people, some people click with certain artists. Jerry really clicked with Jasper Johns. And when I first arrived here, um, these were the most remarkable things hanging on Jerry's walls. Uh, the decoy from, from the early 1970s and decoy two from slightly later. The decoy two is actually printed on reject impressions of decoy one that you see on the left. Very few institutions in the, in the entire country have both. It was amazing to see these hanging in what was essentially the Brady Bunch house. And uh, eventually, you know, they, they came to the McNay uh, with Jerry's bequest in 1993. Another collector I got to know extremely well was, was Robert Tobin. Um, and again, you know, things get, things get difficult when you know, when you know, it's always bittersweet when you know these, we know Robert as a, as a theater collector, but he also had a great eye for things non-theatrical, -thea uh, especially German expressionist woodcut prints, and I'll show you a couple examples of those that Robert collected, both, you know, fantastic works by Carl Schmidt, Rutloff, everything you want in a great German expressionist woodcut where you can see the grain of the woodcut. Everything about these is, just says these were acquired by a great connoisseur of, of German Expressionist printmaking. Uh, and Robert was uh, you know, extremely supportive of me, and in fact, was one of the first supporters of our annual print fair. And one year, he walked into the print fair, and he saw, he saw this. This is a Paul Cadmus drawing, which is on loan from the Tobin Theater Arts Fund uh, here at the McNay. And without missing a beat, Robert saw it and within seconds had bought it. And you know, the dealer was sitting there, the dealer's jaw was on the floor. He couldn't believe that he had just sold this because this is you know, the price of a, a new Mercedes at the time. And, uh, but Robert you know, just said, yeah, I'll take that. And it kept walking. Now. A lot of people hear this story and they think, well, Robert just had all this money and he just bought whatever he wanted. And that's not the case. Uh, Robert knew his collection backwards and forwards and was also a great art historian in his own right. So when he saw this drawing in the fair, he knew immediately he had to have it because it's a study for one of the Paul Cadmus masterpieces at the Whitney Museum in New York. So, you know, he bought it and, you know, it was this, it was a little coup for him to acquire it. As I said, the, the dealer's jaw was on the floor. It was his first time in Texas. And I went over and I walked by him and I said, you know, he was still dumbfounded. And I said, well, welcome to Texas. And uh, so that was, that was always sort of fun. But the point is, is that, that Robert's art historical knowledge and the knowledge of his own collection was such that he could make those decisions really, really quickly. And uh, towards the end of his life, Robert invited me and another friend to uh, Santa Fe, and we went up to visit. And the whole point of the trip, Robert, in Robert's bedroom in Santa Fe, he wanted to rehang all the pictures. So he sent a list, he said, I want the, I want the Dima, the O'Keefe, you know, the Marin, and he listed all of these things off the top of his, of his head that he wanted me to bring up to Santa Fe to install in his bedroom. And so I did, and Robert and I spent the entire day deciding where they would go and where they would hang, and these works brought him a great deal of joy for his entire life, but especially uh, when he was not well. And as I was leaving Santa Fe, uh, he said, you know, he told me, he said, Lyle, I have an idea for an exhibition. And I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, let's, let's see what this is. And he says, I have this idea that we're gonna, I want to do an exhibition about portraits of artists by other artists. And I said, oh, that sounds interesting. And uh, let's work on that. By the time I got back to San Antonio, there was a faxed checklist of the entire show waiting for me 
on my desk. And Robert didn't have a computer. He didn't have a written catalog of his collection. The entire checklist was generated out of his head. So, you know, this just shows you uh, just the depth of knowledge, the art, history, art historical knowledge, as well as the knowledge of his own collection. So this wonderful Jean Cocteau always reminds me of Robert because there's this great picture of Robert with uh, uh, Stravinsky at a concert at UT in 1965. So Stravinsky became one of, one of Robert's idols. So we had to include that, that portrait of Stravinsky by Cocteau. And more and more personal, um, in uh, 92, you know, we were a much smaller institution at that time. And so I knew all the, all the board members. I knew, them, I knew them all, you know, by name. And uh, we would hang out together. And very, it was a very social environment. And of course, I knew Irving and Jean Matthews. Jean, of course, was Marion Sylvan's daughter. She had grown up with the Lang Collection. Uh, so she had honed her eye really her entire life, uh, looking at great works of art. And in fact, Jean's aunt, her great aunt, was a woman named Louise Reinhardt Smith, who gave incredible Picassos to the Museum of Modern Art. And in fact, there's still a gallery named for her aunt at MoMA to this day. So Jean grew up around art and you know, had, had an incredible eye of her own. In 1994, Irving died. Uh, they, were, they were a real unit, they were a duo. There was not much sunlight between the two of them. You would never see one, you would never see one without the other. Uh, we should all be so lucky to have someone in our lives who, who was so important to us that we can never be apart. And that was, that was really Gene and Irving. But when Irving died in 94, um, I was in New York and Gene was in New York and I get this phone call at my hotel and it's the, the, the message is, you know, Jean Matthews is trying to get in touch with you. She wants to have you over for dinner. So she had tracked me down. It's sort of in this, this goes to how tenacious she could be and how, how uh, sort of stubborn <laughs> in certain ways. She tracked me down in my hotel. We went and had dinner. I, I had known her, as I said, but we, we went to this wonderful Italian restaurant and we shut the restaurant down. It was the first of many occasions when we would do that uh, in New York and here in San Antonio. And later, she told me that that was the first time that she had been back at that restaurant, which had been her favorite in New York with Irving. So she, for some reason, who knows why these things happen, uh, she saw in me someone that she wanted to, to, main, to cultivate a friendship with. And uh, I wound up learning an incredible amount from Jean over the years about uh, French food, French menus, French wine, um, how to pay a bill. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, also about how to, how to acquire art. Um, she, was, she was a force of nature. And uh, you know, a lot of people, you, know, you, you see Jean had incredible style, and a lot of people couldn't get past this armor that she put on which consisted of boucle wool and gold and diamonds, sort of hard to penetrate sometimes, um, but she was very protective of herself. And once she got past all of that, there was this warm, compassionate, very wonderful human being that I was lucky to get to know. Every evening here in San Antonio would start out around this desk, which is now in the, in the Brown Sculpture Gallery. Um, so this is a Jacques Gruber, you know, a great masterpiece of Art Nouveau furniture making. Jean and I were both creatures of habit, and so I think that's one reason we were such great friends. Uh, I would fix the same vodka on the rocks in the same glass. We would sit around this desk and decide what we're gonna do for the evening. We did this maybe once a week for years and years and years and years. And I, I tell you all this, and I hope, you know, some people shudder when I do it. But these little shelves that you see at the corners of the desk, they're a perfect place to rest <laughs> a vodka on the rocks. Anyway, Jean, one, another lesson that Jean taught me was that we, we should really live with her art and really enjoy it, and she really did. She worked at this desk really every day of her life and always had her calendar 
you know, open and various invitations uh, that she was deciding whether or not she wanted to attend. She was also, you know, a huge influence with me in uh, learning about French Art Nouveau glass. And thanks to Jean and Irving, we have one of the best collections of French Art Nouveau, Nouveau glass to be found in the country. Uh, I knew nothing about this material before I arrived in San Antonio, but my room in her apartment in New York was covered, uh, one of the walls was just full of books on Art Nouveau. So every time I was there, I would read a different book uh, about Art Nouveau furniture and Art Nouveau glass, and I developed an eye along with her. These were two of our favorite pieces in the collection, the Decorchement uh, vase on the left. We always call it the anteater vase, because I think you can see that the, the long snouts would be perfect for finding ants in an anthill, but in fact, it's, it's beetles. We still called it the anteater vase. And then the wonder, wonderful Leve vase on the right. This is all carved. So, you know, the, he started off with this clear glass embedded with this beautiful gold leaf, layered that with a, a layer of, of red glass, and then carved away uh, to, to, you know, so it's sculptural, it's decorative arts, it's fine arts, it's everything all, all rolled up in one. And Dean and I did spend a lot of time in New York together. And she was a member of the International Council of Modern Art, and I often got invited along with her to, to go to studios and such. And we visited you know, numerous artist studios, including Bryce Martin, Chuck Close, Richard Serra. But after visiting Chuck Close once, she said, you know, I don't have a single work by Chuck Close. So we went to Pace Gallery on West 57th, and we found this, this aqua tent on the, on the left-hand side, this beautiful self-portrait printed in black. So this is, I mean, printed on a black sheet of paper, but printed in white. So it's, you know, this technical tour de force, you know, everything you want in a Chuck Close, but on a fairly small scale. And that was the kind of eye that Jean had. Most of the furniture in her living room here in San Antonio was by Diego Giacometti, the brother of the sculptor. And I'll, I'll never forget this one time, it was during the National Docent Symposium Jean opened up her apartment to all these docents who came to San Antonio, and they were all, you know, sitting around on the Giacometti furniture. And I was doing my little talk about what they were looking at, what they were seeing. And I, when I mentioned that someone was sitting on a Giacometti chair, this one docent, I think she was from Ohio or something, she just leaped out of the chair like someone had lit a firecracker under her butt. And, uh, you know, Jean and I had to stifle our, our, our laughs, but we laughed about that for years after, and you know, this, this docent sort of freaking out that she was sitting on a Giacometti piece of furniture. But again, you know, she lived with her art. We were in Santa Fe once, and we went to uh, James Kelly's gallery, and in the time it took me to turn around to look at something else, Jean had whipped out her checkbook and was buying the Franz West, or vest, and I said, you know, why, what, hmm? Because usually she would talk to me before she bought something, but she, she just fell in love with this piece. And, you know, we got it back home, and we were sitting around looking at it, and, and I was trying to figure out why she had bought it. You know, it's, this, it's a papier mache. It's on, you know, this bit of wrought iron. And I finally figured it out. Jean was a huge fan of uh, the ABT, the American Ballet Theater Company in New York. And so movement meant a lot to her. And so I think you can see you know, sort of a dance movement in this Franz vest. And so I, I gave her that as my theory as to why she bought it. And she said, that makes sense. And uh, <laughs> she, bought, she bought the Richard Serra for very much the same reason, you know, because there's, it's, a, it's an incredibly gestural work of art where if you mimic, you know, the marks that Richard Serra went to create this drawing, you get a sense of the movement that he made uh, in the studio while it was being created. As I said, it gets more and more difficult. Um, this is my dear friend, Tom Wright. I always called him Tommy, because that's how John Leeper introduced me to him 30-something uh, years ago. Um, so it was really weird getting to know, knowing someone in their 80s and still calling them Tommy, but uh, I did. Uh, Tom was a, was a dear friend, 
and an advisor to me on, on a lot of different things. And his collection had really developed parallel to that of the McNay. He considered John and Blanche Leeper, you know, his family, second family, and he credited them with, with showing, the, showing him, really, how to live life and how to appreciate art. He was a businessman and never had any kind of formal art training, so he really depended on the McNay to teach him about these things, and he learned quite well. One of the artists that the Leapers introduced him to was the great Helen Tor. Uh, Tor was married to Arthur Dove, so she was sort of an unofficial member of the Stieglitz Circle, uh, the, you know, this great mo uh, American modernist group of artists that included Marin, Dove, uh, Demuth, and others. And uh, Tommy had these two fantastic examples of Helen Tor in his collection. The one on the left we'd always called Rocky Peaks, because that was the title that uh, it had on the back of it when Tommy bought it. Um, but we, we lent it to an exhibition, a Helen Tor retrospective, one of the few that's actually been done. And the, the curator there, who's quite a genius, she researched it and found out that it was actually icicles. So Tor and Dove were so poor that they couldn't afford fancy fruit and vegetables to paint. And so they lived on a houseboat and she went outside, she broke off the dirty icicles from the eaves of, eaves of the houseboat and turned them upside down. And so their, their dirty icicles are not rocky peaks. So uh, got a huge kick out of that. But anyway, this is a, you know, an example of Tommy learning, and you know, a lot of collectors did, learning from the example that the McNay set. And I should say that you know, Tom, Tom's gift to the McNay was one of the hardest I worked on because every time I would raise the point of these paintings really need to be at the McNay, he would say, well, you know, I'm an accumulator. I'm not a collector. I'm an accumulator. Kept using those words over and over again. And, you know, I would try to convince him with this very same argument that I'm giving you that this collection developed in tandem with the McNay's, and he finally relented. It took, it took decades of cajoling on my part to finally get these paintings into the collection. And the last collector, actually, whose, whose work is actually on view right now in the Lawson Gallery is John M. Parker, Jr. Um, and perhaps this is the most difficult because it's the most recent uh, collector who is also a very, a very dear friend. Uh, thank goodness I have a partner who ignores me and takes pictures of me occasionally. I hate having my picture taken. So, but, so Keith is often behind me taking pictures without me knowing. But this is me and John and, and our dog Gracia walking along what used to be Town Lake in Austin. I think it's Lady Bird Lake now. Uh, John was a remarkable person, a remarkable collector. Um, about in 1994 when we did the Jerry Lawson Bequest exhibition, we published a small brochure, very modest, and I soon got a call, and it was John, and I wish I could do John's voice. I, I sort of call it his old hippie voice, and he, would, he called, and he said, Lyle, and I said, yeah, and he said, this is John Parker, and I said, okay, you know, I have no idea who this man is, and uh, he says, you know, Jerry was really cool, and I said, yeah, yeah, she was really cool. And he said, you know, she really inspired me to collect. And I said, oh, so how did you know Jerry? So we got into the whole story, right? So I figure out very slowly, I was sort of slow on the uptake, to figure out who he was. And uh, so I went up to Austin. He decided to give us two drawings at that point, uh, a Jack Youngerman and, uh, and a Richard Stankiewicz drawing. I think I have images of them coming up. And I went up to see these works that he wanted to give us because he was inspired by Jerry's example. He had known Jerry Lawson, he had known John Leeper, but very much a collector unto himself up in Austin. He had grown up here in San Antonio, had gone to Alamo High School, Trinity University, but really very independent and very, very extremely, probably the most private person I've ever known in my entire life. And he let very few people in. Fortunately, I don't know, I made the cut as did, as did Gracia the dog. So you see her on the right. This is actually in John's art storage in Austin. 
she uh, is, needless to say, a, an extremely spoiled puppy. Getting to look at uh, Donald Judd and Bryce Martin on the walls of John Parker's storage. These are the two drawings he gave initially in 1994. And you could, you know, obviously not, not works acquired by an unsophisticated, unsophisticated collector. These are great examples of abstract expressionist works of on, on paper, which is actually a weak part of our collection. And John has helped fill that, that gap with his gifts and his bequest. Uh, so John was always watching what the McNay did. He read our annual report. He was he would like uh, just slavishly almost watch our website and read through our online browser to see what we had and what we didn't have. And oftentimes, he and I would be talking, and I would say, you know, well, we don't really have great Warhols at the McNay. And I would get this call like a couple of weeks later, or I would get an email usually, and it would be images of two Warhols he had just bought. Um, in 2000, we did an exhibition drawn largely from John's collection and a small, modest, again, a modest publication. And uh, he was over the moon about that show because someone had, had validated him as a collector was really the great accomplishment of his life was the collection that he built. And towards the end of his life, um, he said, that's it, I'm, I'm tired of I'm tired of collecting art, I'm tired of the responsibility, so I want you to bring a van and pick it all up. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I'm, I'm ready to give everything to the McNay. So uh, that came in 2017, and I thought, okay, well, that's the end of that. You know, here's this great friend who's done this for us, and we'll continue the friendship and, and whatever. Uh, but then John jumped right back into buying. and. He is specially focused on, in the, in the next group of things, on art that really challenged our notions of what art could be. And, you know, he'd studied with Bob Tiemann at Trinity and had been challenged by Tiemann to question what art could be. You know, what is art? How far can we take art and still have it recognizable as a work of art? Um, how do we conceive of art? And so, and again, inspired by Jerry Lawson, he also collected a lot of beautiful things by Jasper Johns. I should say that you know everything comes full circle in your life if you're lucky. Um, my mentor at Yale was a man named Dick Field who wrote the first catalog resume of Jasper Johns's prints. So I had grown up you know, really with Johns in my head. And so to have two collectors, Jerry Lawson and John Parker, who were equally committed to this artist's work was uh, remarkable to say the least. I think that might be the end of it. Have I made it through? I did. <laughs> um, one last word, John's gray alphabets. Um, this was actually hanging in John's last house. As, as many of you know, uh, John had a, uh, a battle with cancer and he lost, uh, died in, uh, just a couple of years ago. It was, it was very hard for us who were close to him and so, you know, the, the bequest, as always, is a, is a very bittersweet moment for me and for others. But this is one of the, uh, the masterpieces in the Lawson Gallery right now. So it's the first thing you see as you walk into the Lawson space. Uh, one of the great, you know, this is huge. Uh, one of the biggest Jasper Johns that, uh, that the artist ever created. So um, I think I can end it there, and I think we may have time for a question or two, yeah. So, yeah, so that's, um, that's 70 years and 45 minutes. <laughs> so I, I should say Viva McNay and happy 70th birthday to you. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions, as I said, um, I'll entertain the question. I may not answer it. <laughs> yes. Well, by all, um, so I, I assume you know this, yeah, but um, um, Marion, do you happen to know the first work that she collected and the last work that she collected? Hmm. 
we, so the question is, uh, for those of you who can't hear, is if we know the first work that Mrs. McNay bought and the last work she bought. We think the first work was the portrait of Delfina Flores by Diego Rivera. The last one, I don't know. That's a good question. She bought a lot from a dealer outside of, uh, who's in, L in LA, named Dalzell Hatfield. And this is another remarkable thing about her story. Uh, Hatfield uh, met her by chance in northern New Mexico. Her car got a flat tire, and who would come up to help her but the dealer Dalzell Hatfield. I wonder how that happened. <laughs> so they, they struck up a friendship, and uh, he would drive, well, he would take the train. Back in those days, you'd take the train and ship objects by train to San Antonio. He'd pick them up in his car. So on a number of occasions, Mrs. McNay actually bought, like the Gauguin self-portrait, was actually bought out of the trunk of Dalzell Hotfield's car in the driveway of the original McNay house. So, you know, you talk about what a remarkable story hers is. That's, you know, that's sort of unbelievable over the top. I'm so glad you asked that, because that's a fun story to tell. Yeah, it just so happened she had a flat tire. What's that? That's next. <laughs> yep, that's probably next. And I'd tell a lot of details in that. But the, Some of you may be curious, like I haven't talked, to, obviously, about a lot of people whom I've known over the years. and. Uh, I, I wanted, I knew I had to keep this to a certain time, so I, I limited myself by talking only about those people who, in the words of Tommy, uh, had gone on to their great reward. There are still plenty of people around who, uh, whose stories I could tell too, but <laughs> not, not now, not now. John Gutzler. Yes. The other one is the Sylvette. And I remember seeing the Sylvette in her apartment and she said, Oh, it's not it's not easy to look at it until after you've had coffee in the morning. <laughs> but could you tell a little bit about those two paintings that would be my favorite? Uh the the Cezanne, of course, is is there's a debate. In fact it was included in a wonderful exhibition called Cezanne, Finished Unfinished. And you know, that's an important question for any artist at what point is something done? And some people think that our landscape is finished, other people think that it's unfinished. And so that's an interesting question. And you know, I think, I think for you know, Mrs. McNay, that painting was about process more than anything else. And I think as an artist, seeing how Zizan applied paint to canvas was really important to her because she knew how it was done and she enjoyed seeing process in the work that she collected. Uh, with the Sylvette, you know, we're, we just got really, really lucky in that. Those were shown, uh, there was a show at the Pearls Gallery in New York back in, I can't remember what year or decade, maybe late 60s, early 70s. And there, it was a series of Picasso's sort of gray portraits from the 1950s, including the Sylvette. And two San Antonio collectors happened to see the show, uh, the Langs and, um, and Tom Slick. And now both of those paintings that were once together in a gallery in New York are, you know, they went their separate ways for a while, and now they've come back here at the McNay. So, you know, that's sort of a remarkable bit of serendipity. Any other? Yes. Gontrova. Yeah, the, the paintings of hers. I was just wondering how they were acquired. Uh, so Robert's, Robert Tobin's first love was the Ballet Russe. And he collected in depth uh, the works of Leon Boxt um, and a lot of the Russian modernists, including Gontrova. Um, so all of the Gontrovas came from Robert. The McNay probably has the best collection of her art in the country. Uh, we have great depth in Natalia Goncharova, but uh, that was just one artist that, that Robert really clicked with 
and collected in depth. So yeah, we're very lucky to have those, those gontrobas. Any other questions? Really, I have all this cheese may and that's it. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. Thank you.